Hello, Tom Lebecki here with the latest edition of the New Theory Podcast. Today we have an extremely, extremely special guest. We have very, we've been very fortunate to have many uh, prominent guests on the show, and this next guest is without exception. He is S- uh, Mastin Pip, a uh, Kip, sorry. He's an author, entrepreneur, and inspirational speaker. He uh, founded the Daily Love.com and was cited by Oprah as being an up-and-coming thought leader of the next generation of spiritual thinkers. Mastin, welcome to the New Theory Podcast. How are you doing today? Mastin, did I lose you? Sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. Oh, okay. Well, listen, we're going to do no it. No worries. No worries. As everybody knows, listen, we gave you the proper introduction, um, and uh, we will jump right in. So, Mastin, I mean, awesome. like, you know, to have Oprah call you one of the, you know, spiritual thought leaders and just having a stellar career, uh, I'd like to first start off with your foundation. How did you start out? Um, I started as a manager in the music business, uh, which is um, – Similar and very different to what I do now in a lot of ways, but um, in the music business, you know, I was in Los Angeles and there was a lot of uh, rancor and uh, <laughs> discord and uh, addiction. And so for me, it was, uh, uh, I, I rode straight to rock bottom. And, you know, when you hit rock bottom or when, you know, when you fail, you do a lot of pondering. And that's sort of when I started getting into personal development material and kind of trying to improve my skill set. And I started to think to myself, like, why didn't I know this earlier? And so I started kind of sharing it, and it just sort of began that way. It was a very sort of uh, innocent process of recovery. (laughs) Okay, so when you say hit rock bottom, what was your poison back then? Was it drugs, alcohol, uh, workaholic? I'm assuming something kind of got in the way uh, to facilitate you getting uh, to the I would say, yeah, on the surface, it was cocaine um, and, and the codependent relationships. Um, but what I kind of found many years later that it was more about, you know, the un- unresolved emotional trauma that was driving a lot of that stuff. Um, but, yeah, uh, definitely drug of choice was, was the white powder. <laughs> so the, Okay, so, so that helped facilitate uh, bringing you uh, to the bottom. But so then, okay, so, you know, and again, I, I'm semi-familiar with your story. That's why uh, I was excited to have Jan so I could film some of the blanks. So then you really turn it around. Was it an epiphany? You know, like, like a moment, boom, like, hey, I need to fix this? Or was it a slow progression? I think it's always a slow progression. You know, I think when you have a breakthrough moment or an aha moment, I think that um, that's one thing because I mean, people have aha moments, like, all the time. Um, but actually bringing an aha moment to life is, is a very slow progress. And so, um, you know, I never really wanted to um, – I never really wanted to do bad things. I just uh, – you know, was coping the best that I could with, uh, you know, the, the tools I had at that time. And at the time, the tools were, you know, drugs and alcohol and all that type of stuff. And, you know, my, I, got, I, I was searching for better tools, essentially. Um, and I found lots of better tools. One of, my, one of my goals back then was to feel as good off the drugs as I did on the drugs. Because um, at one point, I felt really good. And so it definitely was a slow progress. I, I never really... Uh, you know, addicts don't say, oh, man, I can't wait to become an addict and ruin my life. You know, that addiction is a solution to a problem. It's not a very good solution. So I basically went on a hunt to try to find better solutions. And uh, the message I kept getting was uh, the more that you learn and the more that you do and the more that you, uh, you know, embody yourself and you share that with other people, that's going to be sort of the, like what's going to work for you. And I got that through just – you know, trying things and seeing how people would respond. And uh, I've come now to kind of view that process as almost like art therapy because people go to, you know, write or speak or paint or whatever. You know, there's a creative process to help them kind of work out their stuff. And so for me, it was more just a, a creative process um, of just going, you know, when I was writing my daily blog called The Daily Love, um, you know, that was just kind of what I was going through each day. So there was very, very much like a therapeutic process. And, um, I don't think there was ever like a master plan, but it was always sort of like a, a focus on serving people and, 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 and focusing on that more than just like what's, what's in it for me. So I, I wish there was like some epiphany breakthrough moment, but you know, that's, that's like a sexy answer. But the truth is it's a, it's a you know, slogging through the swamp of the insides of me and all the emotional demons that go with that and working through that on a, on a regular basis has been 
uh, the work, kind of like going to the gym, right? Like, is there a quick fix? Not really. You know, if you really want to uh, have a, a strong body or a lean body, it takes work daily. So, yeah, that, that, that's, that's the non-sexy but true answer. <laughs> okay, so, so, so this is an important question. It's probably selfish for me to ask this question because I would like to know personally. Is, you know, we've all been through pretty crappy times, right? And, and yeah, whether sure. it's drug-induced or, 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 you know, whatever, whatever the catalyst is, right? And, you know, we are good people in general, right? But sometimes you do some really crappy things. What do you recommend somebody that gets out of it and grows and evolves? Does that person kind of go back to the person they were crappy to and be like, hey, I was a crappy dude, I'm really sorry? Uh, or, or maybe, no, opposite, stay away from some of those folks in the past because it may be toxic. I'd like for you to weigh in on that thought. Do you mean like previous relationships and stuff? A- exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the old question that scientists used to ask was, is it nature or nurture that makes us who we are? Uh, meaning, uh, is it sort of our environments or is it, um, you know, just like our genes? Um, and, and what we find 100% of the time is that in order to get better, whether it's recovering from addiction, uh, you know, uh, any, any type of uh, lifestyle transformation, uh, the environment that you're in really matters. And so if, you, if you're in an addictive cycle, and let's say you go to rehab or you get free from it for a period of time, and you go back to the exact same environment, the exact same relationship dynamics, and you stay there long enough, you will 100% regress every single time because environment is more powerful than willpower long term. And you can think of it this way, like nobody ever lost weight living at Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> um, and so it's really vital when you're in a lifestyle transformation or a life transformation to have an environment that you're living in and you're in consistently that matches the beliefs the values and who you're becoming, uh, a vision board is not enough. You have to kind of live inside of it because if you're surrounded by people who have those old patterns, those old environments, you'll get signals of danger to the nervous system which will help you shut down and you'll go right back into coping uh, long term. Now short term, sure, for a weekend or you know, the holidays or whatever, yeah, that might work. But long term, you got to make sure your environment is rock solid and the environment includes the relationships that you have, the type of relationship and the style, how you actually relate to each other, the foods that you eat, the quality of uh, the environment, like environmental toxins, uh, the amount of sleep you're getting, um, what you're doing for work, like all of those things really, uh, and where you do all that stuff, all those things really tie into uh, how far you'll go. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a very equivocal, absolutely, you will revert um, if you go back into the exact same environment. Okay, so when you solidified your personal path to recovery and spirituality, you obviously learn that, hey, this might be some of the system, or if other people, you know, get the message or use kind of the power that you had within in order to, you know, help yourself. When did you realize you could help with other people, uh, help other people, and how did you go about doing so? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, I, was, um, I was kind of born that way. You know, uh, my mom... Um, I mean that literally. My mom has a broken back. And so, like, care, like the doctors told her never to have a child. I'm only, there's only one child, me. And, um, and the doctors told her not to have me. And she did anyway. And, you know, carrying me uh, because she had a broken back literally put her into a tremendous amount of pain. So I was sort of born with this sort of unconscious knowing that, like, my presence caused her pain. And I've spent my entire life, because uh, she has been in pain my entire life, help, trying to help her. Uh, feel better. It's been a, a big part of uh, what made me who I am. And so I think I've always, I've literally like, was like wired that way from the beginning um, to sort of help. Uh, also, that was very much modeled by my father for me growing up. He was, uh, he's, he's a steadfast man of principle. He's an idealist. He is uh, always dedicating things to something larger than himself. So that's sort of been in my genetic makeup from, from conception, not even birth, like conception. <laughs> okay. So, but then you've also leveraged it into, you know, a successful business. So how do you... Do you mean like when did I learn I could charge for it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, seriously. Like, so you said, hey, yeah. I, got to be, um, I helped a bunch of people out. Yeah. How did you, you know, start charging for it and how did you scale? Yeah. Um, so the thing about like, like, okay, so 
let me, uh, before I answer that question, I'll give a little context. So there's a difference between people's strengths and their gifts. So the Gallup organization defines a strength as anything that you can do where you produce near-perfect results consistently. And you can have strengths that don't light you up. Like, for example, we had a, a woman who was a you know, CPA accountant, and she, that, that work no longer lit her up. But, man, she could do a tax return without thinking about it, right? She wanted to work with more with, like, in the coaching space, helping women uh, become empowered, become empowered financially, sure, but she was kind of over the, like, widget work of doing all the data entry and stuff like that. But she could do it with absolute precision, and that's a strength that she had. But a gift is uh, more of a soft skill, like empathy, connection, insight, uh, et cetera, that you're born with. And soft skills are becoming far more important as we evolve into artificial intelligence future. But, but it's usually a soft skill that you're born with. When you're doing it, time kind of flies by. It comes relatively easy. And um, because of that, we tend to devalue our gifts because it's like, oh, that's just that thing I do. Um, and a lot of times our gifts were minimized by our parents because, you know, that type of stuff uh, – even just 10 years ago, 15 years ago, wouldn't make you money, but that now today, that's not the case. So it was a long struggle for me to start to charge for my gifts uh, of insight and coaching and the things that I do. Um, and it wasn't until I had couch surfed for two years, I had run out of friends to ask to borrow places to live, uh, where I had to earn money, where I finally decided to make an offer for some coaching services and magically, you know, money appeared. Um, and I had added a lot of value in my community beforehand. And so, um, you know, that was, a, that was a process. But I, I was terrified to put myself out there and actually charge for it. And um, it's still something that I'm not totally comfortable with, uh, but there's a lot more ease now for sure. Um, but but it's, 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 a, it's a weird thing to make that leap. But when you do, and you go, oh, my God, this is working. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm adding value because I really care about people, and oh my God, people's lives are changing, then you feel better about it. Uh, but it's a process. And for me, I had to get to a sort of like a totally point of like my back against the wall where I had to do something. And I, I, I don't know if I can cuss on this podcast, but I call it the OF point, <laughs> where like you go, OF, I got I to, gotta, um, you know, uh, I got to do something here. And when you hit that point where you have to do something, not uh, because you want to, but because you have to. That's typically when people make that leap. And usually when people aren't earning money, uh, when they start a business, it's because they're too comfortable. And it's when they start to get really uncomfortable and they hit that OF point where then they start to get into action. And uh, that can be a really great moment too. No, you, can, you, you can say, oh, shit moment. That's okay. So, oh, so, so, uh, oh shit moment, so, yes. <laughs> exactly. So what's the, uh, what's the best piece of advice that you've given that somebody implemented, and uh, how does it have an impact on their life? Oh, man. <laughs> Best piece of advice I've given. Um, I think probably, I don't know about the best, but one of, one of the top pieces of advice, because I, I work in the trauma-informed coaching space, and, and, and everybody has emotional trauma. If you're in a soul-sucking job, you have trauma. If you have anxiety or depression, you have trauma. If you have a, a, a lot of fights in a relationship, there's a, emotional trauma. Of course, abuse, all those things are, are, are traumatizing as well. You know, post-traumatic stress, anxiety, all those things have root causes in, in emotional trauma. Um, if you went to grade school, you probably have emotional trauma. Um, but uh, one of the things that's really powerful when I work with people who have really uh, uh, intense, acute, like abusive trauma um, is – usually they tend to not speak up or not put themselves out there, not take risks, because on an unconscious level, I mean, they're not aware of it, they don't know this, but on an unconscious level, they're scared that if they put themselves out there, they'll be hurt again. Because when you're starting a business or being visible on social media, you know, going live on Facebook for people is so terrifying. Um, you know, like when you're visible like that, uh, there's a possibility that what happened to you in the past could, could be revisited upon you. And, and when people realize you've been through uh, something like that, that actually, if you don't put yourself out there, the person who hurts you is still winning. And by putting yourself out there, that's how you get revenge. Um, and, you, you know, success is the best revenge. That's a really, really powerful moment for people uh, to realize. And, and, and you start to prove that they say is wrong. I think helping people, especially that first step where they're like, okay, fine, I'll do it. When they, when they realize, like, oh, my God, my success proves the naysayers wrong, 
um, that's a very powerful moment for people to get to get them started and to get them with enough emotional uh, juice and emotional uh, energy to like actually do something and and keep it going. Now, now you're touching on some really important points. How about values? So so obviously you have you know you lead people across their journey, many of which are entrepreneurs. Can an entrepreneur succeed when they're in a business that's not consistent with their values? So for example, can you be a pastor? but own a successful strip club. You know what I mean? Like, can you, you know, can you still be successful with your values not aligning with kind of your entrepreneurial life? Or no, no, that Tom, they have to align, and that's part of the success factor. Like for, you know, you and somebody at your level to weigh in on that. I think it depends on uh, an individual's definition of success. Because uh, every person has a different definition of success. Um, if the definition is, can I make money, uh, then yes, absolutely, all day long. If the definition is and be happy, uh, no. Um, you have to. You got to have make this. You know, Buddha called that right livelihood, where you know what your your thoughts, your words, your intentions, and your actions all line up, and they're all lined up, and and the and the thing that you're doing for work, you know, adds value and helps people and serves people. That's the place to get to. It's a hard place to get to. It's a, it's a journey to get there. Um, and I would also add that um, I believe personally, and based on um, you know, over 10,000 client hours, i got some pretty good data to work with, um, but it is impossible for someone who's entrepreneurial or an entrepreneur to, to, be, to be happy uh, and fulfilled, not only if it doesn't line up with their values, but if they're not doing their emotional trauma work. And a case in point is uh, Elon Musk, who I have tremendous respect for in terms of what he's accomplished. Uh, and he's sort of the poster child, like, icon for this sort of exponential futurist movement, um, and at the same time has publicly uh, stated that there is zero value in analyzing his relationship with his father. And Elon could not be more wrong because it's the unhealed, and he, you know, it's very well documented that his father was abusive, but the unaddressed issues with his father are actually holding him back from living his full potential, from being happy um, and being fulfilled. And uh, on the one hand, it might drive him, in a sense, to be who he is, but to, 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 you know, to enjoy the process, you know, it'd be far better for him to resolve that paternal trauma uh, than to go on to Joe Rogan's podcast and smoke a joint. Um, and so I think that, I think that we, it's not just about values. It's about also your trauma work because you can be lined up in your values, but if, if your nervous system is blocking you and your nervous system is, is your enemy and not your ally to what you're trying to do, you will you will slug through it and not be happy. Wow, that's amazing. All right, because you have many, you spin many different plates. What's front and center for Mass and Kip these days? Um, I'm excited about 2019 because I think for the past three or four years I've been sort of asking this question like, who am I? You know, I started a blog uh, way before blogs were started. Um, you know, I was doing content marketing and stuff before Gary Vaynerchuk had wine. I was doing all this stuff a long time ago. I had a blog called uh, The Daily Love. And, um, and, and we got to like 7 million readers a month at our peak. Um, and I didn't do podcasts because podcasts didn't exist back then. But we did, I did have like audio versions of each blog that people could listen to on the blog. So it's kind of like pre-podcast. Um, and, and I knew what I was doing, and I was, I was certain about it, and we grew something really big, and it was really awesome. And that's how Oprah discovered my work, which is to this day, um, so like, did that happen? That actually happened? Wow. Um, and it's a big, it's a, it's a lot of pressure um, to live up to those words. But um, I stopped doing that work because I no longer found joy in it. You're talking to even earlier about a success. Like, I didn't start that blog to be for money, so I didn't keep it going for money. And I basically killed it about four years ago. Um, and then I was like, well, now who am I? <laughs> and I didn't know who I was, really, which is ironic because a lot of my core work is about teaching people about purpose. <clears throat> and so for the last three or four years, I've been going through this process of trying to figure out who am I and what makes me different than Tony Robbins or my peers like Lewis Howes or Brendan Burchard or Gabby Bernstein or Marie Forleo and all my friends and stuff like that. And, um, and so I, I did that work. And I didn't release my book, Clean Your Power, until I had that answer because I didn't just want to be a carbon copy of somebody else. Um, and so now in 2019, 
like I'm super excited because I kind of had that answer. I know what direction I'm going in in terms of the trauma-informed coaching. It's the only offer in the world that's trauma-informed. I have over 10,000 hours of working with people and their trauma. So I feel uniquely qualified. I found like a differentiator, not just in terms of what we offer, but how we deliver it. It's very customized and personalized, a lot like connection points with our clients. And so I feel very, I feel very aligned and super excited about that because I know like, okay, we're going this direction. And um, it's not just a Tony Robbins copycat or, you know, uh, some like car ring copy of Experts Academy or whatever else might be out there that's like, you know, uh, you know, Brendan Burchard was like way ahead of the curve with people. Um, and I don't want to be like Brendan too or Tony too. I just want to be master and figure that out. So I'm very excited because I, I feel like I figured out like who I am, what I stand for, how to describe it to people <laughs> so they understand it. Um, and you know the results uh, with our clients that we're getting are, are awesome too. So and we're, we're hiring some amazing people away from mental health who are just sick of that system and want to actually do something that gets more results than just you know uh, writing codes on insurance forms for people. So um, it's been a it's been a, a very hard time and a very long pivoting process. Um, but I feel like 2019 kind of feels like a. a, a like a, to me, it's like a, for like a, a phoenix type of year where all it kind of can like rise again uh, because I had something that was working and I, t- I killed it and I feel like, okay, this is what we're doing now and I'm very excited about that. Now, you've been very generous with your time, Aston, and I was able to ask you some meaningful questions. What's one question before we conclude that I didn't ask that you wish I did? Oh, I love it when this question gets asked. Um, hmm. I think one of my favorite questions for today is, how do we solve this political divide? <laughs> is wow. that too dangerous? Okay. <laughs> I, I, let's do this one. Whoa. I'm it's actually, and it's, 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 a, it's, a non, it's a, it's a non-political answer. Believe it or not. All right, shoot, shoot. What is it? So, 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 so what it, it's about res- how to resolve a dispute, right? So it could be a relationship, it could be politics, it could be any topic. When two people disagree, from their perspective, they're right. And they see things differently. And what has to be acknowledged is that someone's behavior is equal to their history, whatever they've been through, plus their current environment. And so if you and I have different histories and different environments and we're trying to describe the same event and we disagree, of course we're going to disagree because of a different history, a different environment that we're in. However, when we go through a process of understanding each other's history and environments, which helps us understand how we view the world, then we can start to see what's right about what other people are saying and also chime in about what's right about what we're saying, and we can find common ground. And the core of the problem today politically isn't Republicans or Democrats. You know, it shouldn't be political to buy a Nikes or something. You know, just choose, you know. Um, but the core of it is the unhealed trauma. And what's happening is because of technology and the way the world is getting smaller and smaller and smaller is that all the sort of pain is sort of amplified. And so people are, are in touch with their pain and blaming other people without realizing, oh, I'm hurt. I need to do my work. And that person over there is hurt. And by the way, this is not an excuse. It's an explanation. And you can't change something on the same level of thinking that created it. And so for us to get through this process, we have to start to listen and start to have compassion for ourselves, start to do our own internal work around what our trauma is, to understand the other side, whatever that side might be, has trauma, and to find what's right about what they're saying. Because no matter how much you vehemently disagree with what someone's saying, there's at least 1% of what they're saying that's right. And so that's the process that's going to help us get through this, uh, through this time. And um, it's not Republican or Democrat. Um, it's, it's more a uh, humanistic issue, and I think um, the more we can get public leaders and the more that we can get conversations that are creating signals of safety to the world, <laughs> excuse me, and to each other, I think that would be better. I don't, it's not, again, it's not political. It's about signals of safety. It's about listening. It's about, you know, getting back to conversation versus accusation. And uh, the last thing I'll say is, is that the number one way to change the world today is to not complain about things on social media, but to reconnect to who you are and to reconnect to what your purpose is about and to do your healing work and to help people and to actually be a part of the, the, the solution. Because uh, complaining on social media is probably one of the single most worthless things someone could do with their life. 
Um, it's really just about adding value and serving people and helping be a part of the, being part of the solution, regardless of what side you're on. Uh, if you're contributing to the solution, then you're good in my book. <laughs> well, Mastin, that, that's amazing. For those who have not heard of you, uh, how can we find you, Mastin? Oh, thanks. Yeah, just uh, at Mastin Kip on all the things. <laughs> so uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I'm very active on Instagram, MastinKip.com. Uh, everything is there. Beautiful. Thank you for being on the New Th- uh, Theory Podcast, and we really appreciate your time, Aston. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me today. <laughs>